Only in America. 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 Hi there. Welcome to Only in America. I'm Ali Nirani. This week, President Trump salutes his heroes, the men and women of ICE and CBP. That you have to go through what you're going through and having to be demeaned by people that have no idea what strength is, is really very sad. And we fight it very hard. And I can tell you all of these people right here and all of the people in this room, we will never let you down. A U.S. Army veteran from South Korea, threatened with deportation, goes to court to speak up for herself and immigrant troops. They will do anything to, you know, fight for this country. So I hope that the Army makes this right. And in my interview with author Gina Thomas, we talk about foster parenting, an unaccompanied child from Honduras, in the midst of unprecedented global migration. Part of what I wanted to, to get across is, especially for Christians to understand that, you know, we can talk about compassion and justice all we want, but walking through it just, I mean, there's, there's no sugarcoating it. It's hard. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nirani with Only in America. Up till this point, summer 2018 has been dominated by news of children being separated from their parents at the border and the increase in immigration rates in cities and towns across the country. As of today, over 500 children remain in U.S. custody and separated from their parents, many of whom have already been deported. And we've seen a significant increase in the number of non-criminal, undocumented immigrants detained and deported. In this month's issue of The Atlantic, Franklin Foer dives deep into the past, present, and future of immigration and customs enforcement. The story is based on the Mauritanian community living in Columbus, Ohio, a community now living under the threat of deportation to a nation that still practices slavery. In fact, they are so afraid of torture and enslavement should they return to Mauritania that many are considering self-deportation to a country like Canada. From the perspective of the Trump administration, packing up his belongings, preparing to leave the country is a success story. We're in a new era. Mauritanians responding with the self-deportation does show where the arrow is pointed. Like Franklin said, the Trump administration sees this as a success. In fact, earlier this week, officers from Customs and Border Patrol and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, who implement the administration's immigration enforcement policies, were celebrated by the president at the Salute the Heroes event. In major cities across the nation, these open border radicals have blocked access to ICE buildings, to face public property, and threatened public safety. And what you hear in the newspapers and on the news is nothing compared to the way it really is. And we're stopping it very, very strongly. But that you have to go through what you're going through and having to be demeaned by people that have no idea what strength is, is really very sad. And we fight it very hard. And I can tell you all of these people right here and all of the people in this room, we will never let you down. But there is good news to share. Army specialist Ye Ji Si, an immigrant from South Korea, was granted her U.S. citizenship last week, one month after she sued the government demanding a response to her citizenship application. What this means is that she can remain in the country and pursue her dream of serving our nation. I didn't think I would be 30 and like have no status, be scared of uh, being deported. I can't speak for all immigrant soldiers, but I know that they're incredibly sincere and they will do anything to you know fight for this country so i hope that the army makes this right finally i want to tell you about my grandparents my grandparents lived about a mile away from where i grew up in salinas california when i was a kid i remember my sisters and i would be so excited to spend the night at their place mainly because we got to drink coca-colas with our dinner and for breakfast my grandfather would take us to get donuts from winchell's but for my immigrant parents who were running their small business, it wasn't about the soft drinks and the donuts. It was the fact that my grandparents were a critical source of support for the family when we needed it most. 
I was reminded of this as I read a New York Times op-ed by Stacy Torres about the important role of immigrant grandparents caring for their U.S.-born grandchildren. It's a role that is being challenged through President Trump's push to end family-based immigration. In the op-ed, Torres writes, Older parents serve as valuable resources, often helping with the down payment on homes and with child care and household chores as younger immigrants juggle tight work schedules. Their assistance is free and reliable, allowing adult children to work, improve their English, and further their educations, thus integrating into American society. For me, I will never forget growing up with my Pakistani grandparents nearby. And neither will my parents. I'm Ali Nurani. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the James Irvine Foundation, expanding opportunity for the people of California, and from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, established in 1911 by Andrew Carnegie to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. This is Only in America. I'm Ali Nurani. Gina Thomas, along with her husband Andrew, served four years in northern Mexico as a missionary. She is the author of A Smoldering Wick, Igniting Missions Work with Sustainable Practices. At the beginning of August, I read an amazing op-ed from Gina in Christianity Today. She told the gut-wrenching story of fostering a four-year-old girl from Honduras who came to the U.S. in 2017 as an unaccompanied minor. After eight months with Gina's family, the young girl was reunited with her mother. Gina and I talked about her experience and the importance and meaning of shalom in today's story of migration. My mom is Italian and my dad is very American. Um, and so we actually grew up around a large Italian family in upstate New York. Went to the pizzeria all the time. It was my family's pizzeria and went to eat suppers together. It was always very loud and you kind of had to yell to get your, get your voice heard, but um, always fun and look back on that time with a lot of fondness. I'm getting the sense of like a you know mystic pizza, uh, Julia Roberts type of uh, situation here. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so when I was about 12 years old, for financial reasons, we needed to move to a different place. So we kind of moved around a couple of times um, and ended up in well, right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And we've been here um, since I was 13. My husband and I, when when we got married, we decided that we wanted to move to another country for a while. So we actually ended up working as missionaries in Mexico for about four and a half years. And our son was born there. We came back to the United States. I was finishing up my grad degree and felt like we really needed to be in a situation where we could start paying back some of that student loan. So we came back to the U.S. and have been in North Carolina now for about four and a half years. And what, what led you to make the decision to you know move to another country and, and serve as a missionary? I had traveled around the world a lot. So some of it was through school. Um, some of it was for missions. And then some of it was because some of my family lived in, in China for a couple of years on business. And so I had been traveling quite a bit. I lived in Honduras for about a year and a half before I got married. By the time we got married, was just ready to to move to another country again and kind of get outside of the American bubble. It kind of goes in swings for me where I come back to the States and I can handle it for a little while. And then I'm like, okay, I need to get out again. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, we had decided that we really wanted to to work towards something to that degree and, and not necessarily missions. We had thought about the Peace Corps, um, something where we were actually kind of in a position to serve others and learn more about ourselves. Um, and it turned out that that opportunity kind of fell into our laps and we decided to go. And uh, had your husband had the same experiences or was he kind of saying, okay, well, I'll, I'll give this a try if you say it's going to work out? <laughs> yeah, no, he, he had been on, um, I think, two missions trips maybe um, short term and they were to Puerto Rico. So he had a little bit of that experience, but this was a very new thing for him. And he actually didn't speak any Spanish um, when we first moved there. So within 
Um, the first couple of months were really, really hard. But then about seven months in, he started having conversations with people in Spanish. And yeah, I just really saw him blossom in his language. And then I became jealous because I was like, it took me so long to learn this language in school and you learned it in seven months. So, but you know, that's how it goes. Survival, right? Um, right, exactly. What's life been like in Charlotte since returning? It's been really challenging. Um, we didn't make a lot of money when we were on the field. Um, we were independent missionaries, so our support was was very minimal. And then when we came back to the States, we didn't have jobs laid out for us when we returned. So um, in a lot of ways, I think that we kind of fell under the spell of the American dream, um, if you will, because we just kind of assumed we would come back to the States and find good jobs and kind of build back um, everything that we had, at least financially, the things that we had, you know, other people in our same age bracket already had decent finances and ours was just very, very minimal. So, but we ended up needing to to be on government welfare for a couple of years. My daughter was born, she just turned three, she was born three years ago. And a couple of months before she was born, um, my husband lost his job. So we we were really kind of just struggling a lot um, economically. And that was very eye-opening. And, you know, in the midst of it, you kind of think, what have we done wrong? Like, what did we not do? You know, you kind of get into that, for those who understand the the concept of the prosperity gospel, you kind of get into that mentality where you think, well, we we took a wrong turn here. We shouldn't be doing with this, dealing with this. But the reality is that that is the reality for a lot of people's lives. And being privileged in a way to walk through that was an honor now looking back on it because it gave us a perspective that we never had before and one that I think everyone really needs to have and to really understand what it's like to to not know where your next meal is going to come from. I think it's important that even if people don't walk through that to really try to be empathetic towards that. It's really interesting because as I was, you know, thinking about this conversation and, you know, went to your blog and you know, read some of the, the things that you've written. It's an incredibly diverse perspective that you have brought to just a range of issues. And obviously, we want to talk about immigration and um, you know fostering a, a child who was an unaccompanied minor. But I mean, you've also written about race relations and uh, and poverty. I think the the race relations issues really came about. I think the root of that was understanding what it was to be a minority. I mean, we, we lived in Mexico for four and a half years. We were um, often the only white people in the room. And, you know, that gives you a new perspective as well. And then kind of returning to the States and then becoming really good friends with um, especially a couple of women of color who really opened my eyes up to the situations that they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Things that I just never knew about before because I wasn't taught and and maybe, you know, partially it's not just because I wasn't taught. I wasn't seeking it out either. So I don't want to put the blame all on, you know, everyone else. But really became just, just open to understanding that scenario. And then I went to the Justice Conference. Um, I think it was like the year after we got back. And pretty much the whole conference was about race. And I was, I was really struck by it and initially very angered by it, to be very honest. Um, and then started kind of opening up and trying to understand what that was about. When you say you're angry about it, what do you, what do you mean? Um, I guess part of me was like, why do we have to be talking about race relations when, when there's poverty? Like that was kind of my, my mindset. Like, why are we talking about race when we need to deal with poverty? And when I attended the conference, I was there with a good friend of mine who is a white South African and he has been his whole life dealing with race issues. And so he really encouraged me to to think through some of these thoughts that I was having and the anger that I was feeling and to start opening up to understanding better the issues that are really at hand in the world that I live in. I think it's been easy for me to focus on international issues um, throughout my life a lot more than paying attention to what's happening right around me, which actually kind of leads me into foster care. So we had tried to adopt in Mexico. And um, as I was going through my graduate degree program uh, through Eastern University, um, really started opening my eyes up to, again, like I just said, the the reality of life around us, um, rather than looking into like other countries and other places. And so when things didn't work out for us to adopt in Mexico, and we knew that it was time for us to come back to the States, we started looking into foster care. 
and just have been amazed ever since. We ended up taking the, the classes, which were like 10 weeks long. Um, but then not long after that, we couldn't because of economic issues. And then once we kind of got off welfare, then we kind of redid the training and began. It was last October that we began as foster parents. So that's been a whole new a whole new awakening as well um, to realize all the different children that are in need right around the corner. And my focus for the past, you know, since college probably has been, I want to adopt internationally, but now it's, it's like, well, why take a child out of the culture that they're in when there's so many right here that need, need loving and supporting families, whether it's for a month or, you know, forever. So a couple of weeks ago, you wrote an essay in Christianity Today, and the title was, My Foster Daughter Was Separated from Her Family at the Border. And it's just an incredible essay because what I, you know, and what I, what I found so powerful about it was, you know, you didn't sugarcoat it. You really gave a clear sense to the audience of why you made this decision and then the challenges both for Julia and your family. The decision to foster her was kind of... I, it was a very challenging decision. And, and the reason it was so challenging is because we had another child in the home with us at the time. And initially we thought this was only going to be um, a weekend placement and that we had thought at the time that the, that she was under federal jurisdiction, which officially she was, but ICE and ORR never came to get her in court the next week or the week after that. So it turned out to be a situation where she needed a long-term placement. The only reason that we ended up even getting that call to begin with is that the social worker was calling around to different people that she knew spoke Spanish. And she knew that me and my husband spoke Spanish. And we were the only um, foster family within the county that both parents spoke Spanish. Because her um, language needs were so strong, they decided to to kind of change things around if, if we wanted to, to, to switch also, this sounds horrible, but to switch out the one child for the other child. And there was really no other place for her to go. I'm sure they could have found something and figured something out, but we kind of felt like we are able to meet her needs in a way that, that maybe others in this area can't right now. And so maybe we should try to try to work, you know, work towards that. It was one of the toughest decisions we ever had to make because we had been with uh, our other um, foster child for several months. And while we didn't know whether that was going to lead to um, a permanency plan or not, we felt very connected to her. So it was just a really challenging thing to do because we had previously tried to have two foster kids in our home. We have two two biological kids as well. And um, it just it just was overload. We We were at the end of our rope, all of us actually, when that happened. So we knew we couldn't do that again. So it was just really challenging because in a lot of ways, there were so many conflicting uh, needs because when one child, you know, the best thing for one child conflicted with what the best thing was for another child, it's like, this is all gray area and there's no right answer. But we decided to to stay with Julia and um, looking back on it, I'm really glad we did because I feel like we were able to advocate for her return with her mother a lot more and a lot quicker than than maybe others would have. And and I say that because the different officials that we were talking to um, between Honduras, the United States, um, some of them only spoke Spanish. So because of my language, um, I was able to speak Spanish with them and kind of push the process along further, if that makes sense. Whereas the social worker couldn't, okay. so she wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, I feel really grateful and, and privileged to have, have walked through it, but it was certainly very hard. And um, I'm glad that you were able to read you know, the reality of that in the story in Christianity Today, because that's part of what I wanted to to get across is, especially for Christians to understand that, you know, we can talk about compassion and justice all we want, but walking through it just, I mean, there's, there's no sugarcoating it. It's hard. It's hard work. Right. You know, one of my favorite lines in, your, in the essay is when you wrote, um, praise God for <laughs> avocados and tortillas. <laughs> Oh man, they they saved us. <laughs> that was just profound. <laughs> so I, I gotta, I have to ask, what, what's your favorite avocado and tortilla question then, or, or story? Oh my goodness. Um, let's see. There's so many. We initially when so the first weekend that she was with us, and we, you know, we just thought she was going to be there for a little while. Um, again, she's Honduran, and a lot of people might mix that 
up with with Mexican, but she's Honduran and it's very different food than Mexican food. And we were at a a family get together and I don't even remember what they were serving. I think it was barbecue and maybe like um, baked beans um, and a couple of other things. And she took a look at that food and she was like, nope, not eating this. <laughs> um, nope, so, nope, we, nope, nope. Uh, so I took her to, it's it, the, the home that we were at was not very close to a lot of other places, but there was a Mexican restaurant in that town. And so we went to the Mexican restaurant and I looked on the menu and I was like, there's nothing that looks Honduran here. So we got to figure something out. So <laughs> I like had a special order at the Mexican restaurant for just avocado and some cheese in a tortilla. That's all she wanted. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't know, she didn't want to eat breakfast with us. I can't remember what we tried to give her for breakfast. So she hadn't eaten much all day. So when we finally got that tortilla, it was like, okay, she does eat like we're going to be okay. We're going to make it. Um, but the Mexican man who was serving us was kind of like, what, that's what you want? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what we want right now. <laughs> so, oh man, that's great. So before, before this experience with Julia, you know, what was your perception of not just the immigration system, but also, you know, the journey that children like Julia yeah, go through that, much less um, their parents? Wow. That's a great question. I really had no idea. I had a, a tiny idea from, you know, articles and and maybe some stories that I've read over the years, but I really didn't understand even the term unaccompanied minor. I had no clue what that meant. I didn't when they initially told me that ORR was in charge of her, I was like, what is ORR? I have no idea what that is. So there was a lot of learning that needed to be done and really since then and of course leading up to so there's a book coming out soon but leading up to that um i have done so much research and trying to understand what it what her process was in coming to the states because when they initially said that she was neglected by her sponsorship family i was like i don't even know what a sponsorship family is so there was all these different things that i needed to really look up and one amazing thing about all of this is that I believe it was three days prior to her being placed into our home, I started reading a book um, called Enrique's Journey. Have you heard of that? It's um, it's a book by Sonia no, no, I Nazario, I believe her last name is. And um, it basically, she, she trails um, Enrique, who is a teenager moving from Tegucigalpa up to the United States trying to find his mom. She does. She writes. Yep. She does mm -hmm. a lot of writing for the New York Times, right? When Julia came into our home that night, I opened up this book, and at the very front page, there's a map that shows his journey from Tegus up to the United States. And I looked at that, and I was like, I can't, I can't believe that I'm reading a book right now that's showing me the map that's very similar to the map that the girl that now lives in my home traveled to get to where we are right now. It's just phenomenal how those things work and how many different stories now that I've started researching all this, how many different people have traveled the, the same path. It's amazing. You know, as you're thinking, as you've gone through this experience, you're reflecting on it, you're now thinking, of, you know, you're now writing a book about it. What is the message that you want to share with your community? I think, I think the biggest, the biggest thing that I hope to get across um, with the book is specifically for white evangelical Christians to understand that whatever framework we have had prior to being in proximity to people who have traveled these roads, we have to be better listeners to hear their stories and to not just immediately say, that's just their story, or that's one person's story, or not just say, you know, that's a, that's a lie. That didn't actually happen. Um, I think too often we look at, you know, these individual stories and we, and we see them as one moment in time, rather than seeing them as systemic issues that really need to be dealt with. And in a lot of ways, you know, we as white Americans benefit from the struggles that that people walk through. And I think that we need to be a lot more aware of the ways we benefit and a lot more aware of how we don't listen to these stories. And we really need to start there in order to start advocating so that we really can share the Imago day that's inside of each person and really understand that for what it means. You touched on a couple of things that I've been wrestling with. Um, and one of them is, you know, proximity or, or that personal experience. And, you know, either you're hearing a person or really listening to a person and, and respecting their story. So that's one piece. And then the other piece is the, the systemic dysfunctionality, for lack of a better term, 
of our immigration system. And at least the way I've been trying to think about this is, you know, there's a individual act of grace, but mm. there's a, a lack of trust in the system. As a result, we're led to believe that, you know, we're either a nation of laws mm. or a nation of grace. And that grace That's is true. very individual. The law is very systemic. Though I guess what I've been thinking about, and I just want to, would love to get your feedback on this is, you know, where does the concept or the idea or the, the process of reconciliation fit into this? You know, I think more in terms of the word shalom than I do reconciliation, but I, I definitely hear what you're saying there. I think that word can have some negative connotation to, to some people just because reconciliation assumes that people have been consiled to each other first, right? So I think about the concept of shalom a lot more. And I think about how in true shalom, everyone is flourishing. And whether it's someone who's economically less fortunate, or however you want to say that than me, for example, there's still opportunity and there's still dignity. And yeah, there's still flourishing that's happening there. And so I think when it comes to understanding better the immigration issues of our day, I think we need to start there. I think we need to say there's no numbers that can replace who a human being is. So we can read all the data that we want. We can throw out all the statistics that we want, but a human being is a human being. And I feel like if we are Christians, we have to at least start there, that there's dignity that we as Christians, I feel like are mandated to give to other people, whether that person is someone who we deem good or deem bad, whether that person looks like us or doesn't, whether that person came across the border like we thought they should or shouldn't, there's still dignity that belongs to that person that's God-given. And when we try to take that dignity away from them, I feel like we are becoming like, we're, we're trying to be a God in their life. And I don't think that that's fair. I don't think God gives us that right to become God-like. Um, and I think too often we we have those God complexes and we try to to assume that we know the situation and gosh, this this story and living the story has shown me so much. And even even while Julia was in our home, there was so much about her mother's story that I did not know. And now learning so much more about that, it just it's just amazing what a human being is capable of. And then just to think that a lot of these parents who are coming across the border, what they've suffered to get there, then have to suffer even more and deal probably with lifetime trauma that is currently being caused from that zero tolerance policy. I just, I feel like it should break all of our hearts. Yeah. In your essay, you wrote, um, no, we are not saviors, but we know Christ and his endearing love reminds us that we don't have to solve the entirety of the immigration problem or any other problem in order to get involved. You know, that, that line or those lines, um, they're both practical and aspirational. And it, it, it you know the clarity of what what of your experience and how you how you've described it and how, how you're reflecting on it. I think is just Thank so incredibly so helpful. Will be so incredibly helpful to so many people. Um, so, <laughs> since you've cheated a little bit and you've yes. kind of snuck ahead to listen to other podcasts, you know the question that's coming. <laughs> you're going to get. <laughs> therefore, one. I'm expecting a doozy of an answer. Um, yeah. So, so the the question is to or the request is to finish this only sentence. in America. Only in America, with the granddaughter of Italian immigrants from one side of her family, and descendants of those who came on the Mayflower on the other side of her family, fall in love with learning Spanish in college and end up fostering an accompanied minor who was labeled unaccompanied because of the current xenophobic presidential administration. Gina Thomas, thank you so so much. Thank you. <laughs> Gina Thomas is an author, wife, and parent. She's writing a new book about her experience, the working title of which is Borderless Motherland. There's more about Gina at our website, immigrationforum.org. And that's all for this week, with thanks to producers Regina Medina and Emily Chow, and executive producer Kathleen Farrell. Don't forget to subscribe to Only in America at our website, immigrationforum.org. I'm Ali Nirani. Talk to you next week. Mm -hmm.